This week is an interesting week in that you're going to be introduced to MOM, which is, stands for Medicine of the Mind, but is also, it's really psychiatry. Anatomy is, this is stuff that's relevant even now. We just had some tests on some of these questions. So that's stuff you're going to want to keep in mind. The biochemistry is really, the gene technology is quite um, unusual. It's like cloning and stuff. It's not too high yield. And then you'll be introduced to HEP, which will be fun. Uh, Hold on, give me one more second. Yeah, we're good. Okay. So you're, you're being introduced to quite a lot this week and it's picking up, but the metabolism will start to slow down, which might be good, might not be. Um, we've changed our system in which we're going to put these keys in the top right to help with the yield. And um, we're going to go back and do that because everyone was unavailable this week. We kind of didn't prioritize doing that, but we will do that for, so it's useful for you in revision. If you have any questions at all, write them in the chat and I'll try to look at them while I present. I might not know the answers, but I'll do my best. So we're gonna start with anatomy, which is my favorite of this week. There are four types of tissues. These tissues include epithelium, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. Today, we're gonna to begin with epithelium, Throughout your lectures, we'll be going through all of these tissues. Epithelium is unique in that it has its origin in all three germ layers, which you don't need to understand yet, so don't worry about that. These are the four primary tissues. This is something you need to remember, and we just had a second year quiz and they asked us this question, so you should know this. Epithelium, connective muscle nerves. Epithelium lines the internal and external surfaces of the body. So it lines lumens, which are hollow tubes inside the body, such as the gastrointestinal tract. It lines the airways, the trachea, which are the trachea. It also lines bronchi, alveolar reproductive tracts. It also lines blood vessels in the endothelium. So it lines the outside of the body and any kind of holes inside the body. Holes are called lumens that are in the body. It has four primary functions. The first is to protect. So it provides a physical barrier that, um, protects the body from debris and harmful agents. Lumen that are frequently damaged are often lined with something called squamous epithelium, which are small cells that, rapid, that are quite labile, which means they rapidly regenerate and um, proliferate quite quickly. quickly. <laughs> and these protect viscera and underlying structures. Epithelium can also secrete substances such as sweat or mucus. And these are important both in um, Im immunology and protecting people from pathogens as well as just physically from debris and toxins. Epithelium are also important in absorbing substances. So your cells in your small intestine facilitate absorption of nutrients, as well as there's filtration in the kidneys, which filters blood. Finally, epithelium are also really useful for transport. They act as junctions that regulate what flows between cells and inside of cells and what can cross membranes and what can't. And often these are combined with regulatory um, regulatory components, components to control what comes in and out. They have five characteristics that are useful to remember. Firstly, there's very little space between the cells. This supports structural and, and anatomical um, integrity of these structures so that um, normal physiological functioning can occur. They're strongly attached to each other between intercellular junctions. Intercellular junctions are probably the hardest part of this topic, which we'll get to in a bit. They're oriented or polarized, which means their bottom adheres to a basement membrane and they have an apical surface, which is the top that faces into the lumen. And they're all orientated like this, so they can have correct functioning. They're avascular, which is interesting and might be counterintuitive. There are not blood vessels that directly supply epithelium, rather nutrients and oxygen diffuses in through capillaries through to the, um, to the cells. We'll go in that in a second. And the fifth is they sit on a basement membrane which is a kind of fibrous structure that um, is important for both the integrity, it's important for keeping little space between, and it's important in the diagnostic of cancer, diagnosis of cancer. So these are intercellular junctions. There's a few types. The first type is called a tight junction. Think of this as a watertight seal. If cells have tight junctions, water cannot pass through. They're completely fused together. There are Gap junctions, which have little um, proteins that facilitate the transport of ions in and out. They um, can transmit electrical signal signals and are important. You have adherins, which are connected by, the side, which connects the cytoskeleton of two adjacent cells to each other. 
and it helps keep little space between them and provides integrity. Desmosomes are quite similar to adherins, except they use um, they use intermediate filaments and hemidesmosomes are desmosomes, but they're on the basal surface. So another uh, important way to think of this is you can think of it as in their kind of altitude on the cell determines what they are. So tight junctions will always be the highest. They'll prevent water going through. Then you'll have adherins, gap junctions, desmosomes. There's a couple of tables. This is a table I got from Wheatle and it kind of explains in detail what each of them do. All you really need to know, tight junctions, water tight, water doesn't go through. Zonular adherence can excite a skeleton together. It's very cohesive, the cell moves together. Desmosomes um, use intermediate filaments and they also link cytoskeletons together. Hemidesmosomes are desmosomes, but on the basal surface and probably the most high yield here, Gap junctions facilitate the passage of ions and small molecules between cells, facilitating intracellular signaling. Um, this is kind of my, I wrote this out as well. Um, you can use either of these for your notes to look, read through and understand, but this is essentially what we've said. So now we're gonna start with the characteristics of each cell. So epithelium have strong attachment between cells and in order to facilitate their function, they have certain specializations on their apical surface. So apical surface is a surface that faces a lumen. So in the small intestine, you have something called microvilli, which are hair-like protrusions of the cytoskeleton, and they increase the surface area to enhance absorption in the small intestine. You have cilia that are larger than microvilli by about 10 micrometers in length, and they function to support movement. Um, in the trachea, they um, so they kind of flush the mucus out with the pathogens and debris to your throat where you can swallow it. Also, you can cough it out. So cilia use for movement. They're also in ovaries. They are used to move the eggs. And in stereo, and stereo, there's also stereocilia, which are unfortunately named. They're not cilia. They're long motel microvilli actin strands, and they really have sensory functions. Um, you, need, you should know microvilli and cilia. Stereocilia are less um, high yield orientated and polarized. This is kind of straightforward. The apical surface faces the lumen where all the proteins and the, um, so transport can occur through the proteins. Basal surf surface attaches to a basement membrane, which is this rigid fibrous membrane that um, anchors the cells in place. And it's important to have polarization so cells are in the correct direction. In pathology, sometimes this can be disturbed. A vascular, there is no blood supply to epithelium. Blood vessels cannot cross the basement membrane to supply the epithelium. So let's see if I can, because I'm aware you haven't actually been exposed to this. So let me tell you what a basement membrane is. It's quite simple. This is an epithelium cell. Wow, that's a good drawing. These are all on their basal surface attached to this, this kind of membrane that anchors them in place so they can't move. That's all it is. It's just an anchor. And so the way that epithelium acquires nutrients and gets rid of carbon dioxide and waste is through diffusion into capillaries and underlying connective tissue. Um, this is the basement membrane we've been talking about. Basement membranes are, are um, it's not important what mesenchymal cells are. They're made up of type four collagen and laminin. Again, quite low yield. These are just kind of fiber. Um, they have protoglycan heparin sulfate. All that means is it's sticky. And that means they stick together. They have a high affinity for the cell um, basal surface. Um, a basement membrane is porous so that the um, nutrients can diffuse through. And its function is all of what we've talked about, cell adhesion, orientation, it blinds the plasma membrane. But most important is for you to know, and this will be assessed most likely, a normal epithelial cell will never cross the basal lamina. It will never go... I want to say, let's annotate, it'll never go beyond this fibrous surface. So you can see here there's basement membranes that are anchoring these cells. If a cell does not, isn't anchored by it, it's, it's most likely cancerous. There's definitely pathology. All you need to understand about basement membranes is they're a thin mesh of connective tissue that anchors epithelial cells. Epithelial cells should not cross the basement membrane. Now we're going to talk about classification of epithelial cells now that you kind of have an idea of what they are what their structure is. And a good thing with, about epithelium, unlike the other connective tissues, are quite, it's quite intuitive. You see your skin and you know what it does. So epithelium can be classified in two ways. 
either according to its layers. Simple means it is one layer of cells. Stratified means it's several layers stacked on top of each other. And it's also classified by its shape. Squamous is like a thin, like they talk about a cross section of an egg-like shape. Cuboidal is a, cubo, is a cube, columnar looks like a column. And there's some exceptions that we'll talk about later. Simple squamous epithelium. So as you can see here in the picture on your right, you have, this is squamous from like, it's an axial section, I think. And there's just one layer of cells. They're very small. If you look at them head on, if you look at the less picture, they just look like kind of sheets with this nucleus. They're a thin layer. The nucleus is elongated and dense and the nucleus um, mirrors the geometry of the shape. These are important because they line blood vessels that allow diffusion to occur because there's very low resistance from these structures. So it's easy for things to diffuse through them and they allow the passage of small molecules, gases, nutrients, etc. And they're also quite permeable, which is involved in immunology. If you have an infection, you're, you might have done this in bio. I didn't do bio, but I think you would have done this in bio. You, um, you're endothelium cells can become quite leaky. And the reason why it's important that these are simple squamous epithelium is it allows leukocytes, which are white blood cells to migrate. They're also quite labile, labile which means they proliferate quite readily and quickly, which means they're often in areas of high trauma. They experience a lot of, yeah, like blunt force of trauma. So in your throat, when you're swallowing, you're gonna have a lot of squamous epithelium. So food brushes against it and it'll, um, Layer. But that is more actually, you know, that's more the blunt force is more stratified. Simple is more for diffusion. We'll get to the blunt force later. Um, I have my pen on and I can't get rid of it. Clear all drawings, escape. Awesome. Then you have simple cuboidal epithelium. This looks like a cube, unlike the other one, which kind of looked like a disc. In these, the nucleus is spherical, and these cells perform secretion and absorption. And for example, they line the cells in the salivary gland. They line renal tubules, glandular ducts, ovaries, etc. Lots of places. Simple columna. So now, this a lot of people might be okay. Let me explain. So a simple columna has an elongated nucleus. It's the nucleus is usually situated toward the base of the cell, toward the bottom third, and it also has an absorptive and secretory function. So a lot of people might be wondering what the difference between columna and cuboidal are. Um, essentially, a narrow columna and like a long cuboidal it's kind of arbitrary they're quite similar and it's just referring to their shape um, mainly they just their um, functional role is absorption and secretion there is some protective role of the larger cell it's harder for toxins to penetrate through in the stomach for example but really you're going to have bicarbonate and mucus that's protecting that so they're quite similar it's just um pictures you have stratified squamous which are multiple layers so unlike simple squamous, where you could have diffusion of nutrients and clot blast vessels, diffusion is um, oxygen and gases are going to struggle to get all the way through here. These line the buccal cavity, pharynx, and esophagus. Um, and essentially, if you have any layer, like, for example, your skin that has frequent abrasion and what, trauma and stuff, this is the lebel. They regenerate rapidly and they protect your inner viscera and surfaces and stuff you don't want to get injured. Um, the way these form, it's, this is quite an interesting way to think about the connection between all these cell types. You have stem cells here. These are, I'm um, drawing the left image. They're um, kind of cuboidal cells attached to the basement membrane. Some of these are stem cells, and then they proliferate and they produce dorsal cells. Dors they produce daughter cells, which migrate to the surface. And as they migrate, um, some of them lose their nucleus and they become squashed and some of them become squamous cells. So there is a kind of a life cycle towards this. Some of it is interrelated. Any questions, pop them in the chat. Um, keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. This is very high yield, but we only we did it in one workshop. So I don't know why it's so high yield, but it is. Keratinized refers to the outer surface of the skin. So it's kind of hard, rough skin. And it waterproofs the skin and prevents desiccation, which is drying out. So unlike stratified squamous, normal stratified squamous, this is more thick and it's watertight. Um, and this covers areas of the body exposed to really frequent abrasion. So for example, the palm of your hands, the soles of your feet, you can feel like those are more, that is rougher skin than like your cheek, something like that. 
So um, during maturation, epithelial cells accumulate keratin intermediate filaments and keratinization refers to the process in which nuclei of a maturing cell gradually condense until it eventually disappears with other organelles. So you can kind of think of it as a form of apoptosis. Um, these are the layers of the epidermis. This is something that you'll have a workshop on. Um, you can see here at G is just epithelial cells with tight junctions. The keratin part is this wavery stuff. You can see how there's, it's lost its nucleus, it undergoes pycnosis and the cell is enucleated. And this makes it, prevents it from decussating and watertight. Um, keratinization is also called cornification. And you can imagine, like, you, I don't know if you've heard of corns before, but those are like hard patches on the skin. And it's um, keratinization refers to the stratum corneum layer of skin, which is this one. You have other layers to remember. Again, more important later on, but it's useful if you know it now. Then you have something quite confusing. Oh, sorry about this. You have something quite, we changed formatting a while ago. And so now we have to re-edit all our slides. So the pictures don't mesh with the words. Usually we're pretty good about it, but apparently not in that one. So you have something called pseudostratified epithelium. These look a bit messy. So if you look at the bottom right picture, you can see if you just looked at it, you might think that it's stratified. You might think there's multiple layers everywhere and it looks like a bit of a mess. Um, in reality, even if you, it's hard to see, but uh, if you look at the bottom left cell, Um, you can see this looks like a bit of a mess. The nuclei are at different levels. It looks like there's layers and there's a lot going on. So pseudostratified refer to a kind of, they're often columnar cells and they're like are stacked against each other. That's quite disorganized. However, they do all sit on a basement membrane. So each cell of a pseudostratified, while it looks disorganized, you can tell it sit there, each cell sits on a basement membrane. And then nuclei have our varying levels. Um, the way you can differentiate is that the nucleus is usually the bottom two thirds of the cell, quite hard to identify, and pseudostratified epithelium almost exclusively lie in the respiratory tract. So in the respiratory tract, it also means there's probably cilia. So what I haven't talked about, ah, my bad, back we go. What we haven't talked about is that, how do I, there's cilia sometimes. So if any of these surfaces can be ciliated, which means there's small hair-like protrusions on them. Here, let's have a look. You can see in this picture, can you see the hair-like protrusions just over here? That's lined, that's lined with cilia. And often you'll have some goblet cells that secrete mucus. And these are used for immunity and debris. We've talked about them before. Pseudostratified will often be ciliated. Lots of columna can be ciliated. So remember that all of these cells can also be ciliated. We're almost finished epithelium. And then we're up to, and the other stuff is like four slides per topic. It's quite quick. I don't think the others wanted to do much work. No, I'm kidding. Um, transitional epithelium, very low yield, quite difficult. It's exclusive to the bladder. It's waterproof. It's necessary because urine is toxic. And it's expand cell and contractile, which is really interesting. So it can distend and become swell and become waterproof, or it can um, relax. And that um, prevents, it kind of assists the flow of kind of urine through the bladder. It kind of, it's like a pumping function. Um, they're very low yield, incredibly low yield. Metaplasia, this is just a side note at the end. Sometimes if there's irritation to a cell type, you can have a change of morphology. So if you have, um, for example, pseudostratified epithelium in the respiratory tract, if they're exposed to a lot of toxins and pathogens, they might um, be needing to rapidly proliferate to protect the underlying viscera. So you might start to make squamous cells. So there's quite an interrelated relationship between them. Okay, now we're gonna move quite quickly. These are quite smaller topics. We're doing biochemistry. And we're going to start with gene technology, which is a bit obscure, but we'll do our best. If you have any questions, please ask. 
So the first thing we're doing is polymerase chain reaction, which is especially relevant now because this is what the COVID tests use. And what it does is it gets a primer RNA to find an RNA sequence you can recognize. It polymerizes that RNA and basically makes lots and lots and lots of copies of the gene. So you can see if um, the segment you're looking for is there. It involves three steps, which involve denaturation at 95 degrees, annealing at 55 degrees, and extension at 72 degrees. And we'll explain what these words mean in the next slide. So you can see on our left, we have the denaturation stage. All that happens is the temperature in which... So let's say, let's use COVID as an example. Someone puts a swab in the back of your throat. They then put it in their testing kit. Their testing kits has um, nucleotide triphosphates. So um, basically the polymerase has nucleotides to add to the bases. You have something called TAC polymerase. You use TAC polymerase because it operates at really high temperatures. It's quite rigid and can it can like, lots of enzymes will denature at 95 degrees, but TAC polymerase doesn't. And you have primers, which will look for the particular DNA sequence that you want to see if this has. Because you know that the COVID virus has a unique DNA sequence. It is a bit different because it's RNA, but I'll explain that in a second. So you have your DNA. You've then raised it to 95 degrees, so it's denatured, and they've separated. You've then cooled it, so annealing can occur, in which the primers will attach to their target sites. And then you'll change the temperature again, so TAC polymerase can attaches and extends the DNA strand. And essentially, you repeatedly do this, so you have a more and more amount of DNA. And if that primer was looking for your particular COVID DNA, then you're going to see this cloudy solution. You're going to like be able to identify it because you can see this goes in exponentials of two. So two to the zero, you have one strand. Uh, this is two to the second. Two to the third is eight. So it grows exponentially. So you can imagine you can have hundreds of thousands to millions of strands in not a lot of time. So it's quite an effective way for diagnostic. Um, COVID uses a reverse transcriptase, polymerized chain reaction case, chain reaction, because coronavirus is an RNA virus. So first they convert it into DNA and then they do the same process. But uh, surprisingly, like I'm sure when they learned this every other year, this was completely not that relevant. But for us, it's actually a bit more relevant. Now there's something called recombinant DNA technology, which is pretty cool. It's when you combine DNA from two different sources. So um, you can imagine like there's a lot of therapeutic application of that. So often what they'll do is they can get an egg from an animal or a mammal. They can add in a particular gene they want to and insert it into that animal's DNA um, sequence so that it uses its protein to express what you want to express. So I think they make antitrips in that. How does it work? How can you separate it? Let's say you have a DNA strand. You know what's a better example what we'll use? We'll use plasmids. So I don't know if you remember, you have a bacteria, you have a nucleoid with genetic material, and it's like, it's not a nucleus, it's a nucleoid, it's kind of free floating. Then some bacteria have evolved things called plasmids, which are essentially used for antibiotic resistance. This is high yield, you need to know all this. So often what you can do is you can get a restriction enzyme, which will read a code in the plasmid, for example, and it'll cut open, let's change colors. It'll cut open the sequence. So you have two um, sticky strands. And what you do is you insert another GNA code for something you want to express in that, you stick it together, use ligase to stick it, and then that bacteria will start to make that protein. Um, it needs to have an origin criteria for this vector. Vector is what you're using to carry out the function. It needs to have an origin of replication, which you can remember is where it begins the polymerization. Um, and you have the recognition size for restriction enzymes. What's really important is what you do when you do this is you'll get a bunch of E. coli, for example. You'll put them in a test tube. You'll put your restriction enzymes and the genetic material you want. And how do you know if the plasmid has correctly um, kind of, it's been successful, the ligase has been successful and it has this new genetic material. How do you know it just hasn't not worked and you're not making a protein? What they do in the plasmid is as well as inserting 
the genetic material you want to produce the protein, they put in an antibiotic resistance strain. So that if the bacteria has correctly kind of absorbed the plasmids, so bacteria can absorb, let's say that's all plasmids, that's a bacteria. Bacteria can absorb plasmids at higher temperatures. Let's say it's accurately absorbed a plasmid that has correctly received the protein and the antibiotic resistance. You take all these um, bacteria, you put them on a petri dish, you give it antibiotics. Everything that has collected the genetic material you want to transcribe, as well as the antibiotic resistance, will still survive. Everything else will not survive the antibiotics. That's important. I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, I can further explain. This is a picture of what we've been talking about. Um, the picture on your left is looking at your restriction enzymes in your sticky strands. So the restriction enzyme has made these strands where you're going to attach your um, the DNA fragment you want to join. So this is, sorry, let's be more clear. Um, this is the DNA you want, you've separated it. This is the um, plasmid you've separated and you're going to attach them into each other. Um, you isolate a gene that you want from the gene donor. Let's say you want to produce insulin. You get the insulin producing gene. You've cut open the plasmid with restriction enzymes. You've shaked your beaker um, so that the plasmids will go into the bacteria. They ligase the protein making gene into the plasmid. It's gone into your bacteria. It has antibiotic resistance, so it survived the antibiotics. And now it's going to make all your insulin that you need. Almost done. Um, some important things to understand quite briefly. Bacteria does not do post-translational modification, so you're going to get simple proteins. Yeast can do limited post-translational modifications like disulfide, bonds, and glycosylation. Insects is an important. Mammals can do um, complex post-translational modifications. So some there's a molecule that's used to treat cystic fibrosis, and that's needs that requires mammals. So all you need to remember: bacteria, no post-translational yeast, limited post-translational mammal, post-translational, and what you use as your vector is determined by how much tra post-translation you need and at what volume you need. Cloning again, quite obscure, but let's go through it. It's not particularly high yield, but they do focus it a lot in lectures. So you should know it. Two types of cloning. One is somatic cell nucleated transfer, in which you remove an egg from a um, recipient. Someone's giving you an egg to move, to remove their egg. You've kind of stitched in DNA you want, or you've put in the DNA of a person you want to, or thing you want to kind of grow. So you put the patient nucleus into that empty egg. The egg is stimulated to proliferate and form a blastocyst. Don't need to know what that is. It just kind of, it forms a zygote. It starts to proliferate and differentiate. And what it can do is it can differentiate into cell lines you want. So you can make a heart. You can differentiate someone's heart. And what's interesting is because it's using their own genetical material, there's not going to really be much resistance as opposed to someone donating. So just to summarize, I've taken my genetic material. Someone's donated me an egg. I've put my genetic material into an um, someone's egg. It's been stimulated through a variety of factors to go into a heart, and you can put that heart in me, and it will reduce the risk of immune rejection and transplant. The cons to this is there's quite significant ethical considerations that are quite self-evident in making life. You're always going to have this stuff. Second type of cloning is called induced pluripotent stem cells. It's a bit more simple. You're just going to take some cells. Maybe you take some of my epithelium cells. You um, get a vector containing four gene code, gene coding proteins, and you kind of undifferentiate my cell. So it becomes an induced pluripotent stem cell. And then you can induce that to differentiate into a structure that wasn't my epithelium, which it originally was. Um, there's less ethical concerns with this because you're not like creating life and it's from me, from me. Um, it's not always successful and there's a significant amount of carcinogenic risk associated which isn't completely understood but there's a lot of mutations involved that can be carcinogenic almost done 
Gene therapy involves adding genes to already existing cells. For example, if someone has a defective allele, you can, some viruses insert the genetic material into a person to make itself a virus. What you can do is inside of that virus, you can add some genetic material, for example, that um, if you're a diabetic, you can't produce insulin, so it produces insulin. I know that's not how it works, but like as a theory, it produces insulin for you. It puts in that insulin producing proteins into your genes and then you can do it. There's obviously more complications with that, but um, the pros is it produces functional protein, cons it's quite temporary as the proteins and alleles often degrade and there's quite a risk of mutation. Um, something more kind of recent than the virus stuff is something called a CRISPR-Cas9 system. So what happens is you have a Cas9 protein, which is an exonucleus, a CRISPR protein. So there's kind of this nucleus associated to the structure, which will snip a segment of DNA that you want it to snip. And you have, and this is a guide RNA, which tells where it's going to snip it. Then you produce some DNA you want it to, to some RNA you want it to transcribe into the DNA, reverse transcribe, and then that's going to put it in the genetic material. So then that's inside of that person and it can fix their, um, it can edit their genome. So uh, clearer with images, which is in the next slide. Essentially, you don't really need to understand this. The reason why CRISPR exists is it's actually a very, very quite ancient response to viruses. It's like a virus immunity. So a virus will come in and it will infect the cell. Your body will then take I'm simplifying it a bit. You just need a big picture. We'll take its genetic material. It will stitch it into your gene so that it can combine it with the Cas9 nuclease with that guide RNA. So it knows to look for what is virus RNA from memory. It then will look for the virus RNA with that guide RNA and it'll cut it. Can you see my mouse? Yes. So then it'll cut it and that deactivates the virus. So what they've used in therapy is they've kind of used that structure. So you have the Cas9 nuclease, you've made it guide to your DNA. It's going to snip. So this is your target DNA. It's snipped your DNA. You've put in a sequence associated to the nuclease, which is going to be stitched in. And then you have this, um, you've modified your genetic material. You just need a big picture of this really. Um, they show you videos and stuff in the lectures. Um, don't be too stressed. All you need to know is it edits genetic material specifically. That's what you need to know about CRISPR. Maybe you want to know what the nuclease is and guide RNAs, but that um, goes over in the lectures and it's easy with videos. So now we're going to do some metabolism. I hope that CRISPR stuff makes sense. It is quite hard. It's probably the hardest thing in biochem and it's very modern. But yeah, um, let me know if you still have problems. Metabolism. So um, Andrew made this, he's on MedCamp, but it's quite simple. Your body always wants to achieve a state of homeostasis, which is basically equilibrium. It's a non-chemistry word for equilibrium. In the fed state, you're going to want to either synthesize or star store carbohydrates or break them down into energy. You don't want to have just carbohydrates floating around. So your body is going to Deal with that by either producing glycogen or breaking it down. Fatty acid metabolism will increase. So you're going to make tags. It's going to be stored in adipocytes. You're going to make cholesterol synthesis. So if you have a lot of fatty acids, you're going to convert those fatty acids into storage or just get rid of them from the bloodstream as you will get rid of carbohydrates from the bloodstream through storage or through breakdown. Um, and amino acid metabolism will see increased protein synthesis. So it's kind of, it's a state of an excess. You'll build in thins. That's how you can think of it. And excess amino acids can't be stored, so they're just broken down. So if you have way too much excess, then maybe your body will break it down through various pathways, just so it's not all in the bloodstream. But often it will be um, used to synthesize, and that's a general principle. So you're going to want to synthesize carbohydrates and fatty acids. There's sometimes you might get like have some glycolysis to get rid of the carbohydrates from the bloodstream. That was quite a complicated concept that took me a while to understand how it promotes both glycogen synthesis and glycolysis, but that's just to get rid of the carbohydrates from the bloodstream and both of those do that. In a fasting state, uh, get rid of all these, 
In a fasting state, you have a low level of glucose, which means you're going to have less glycogen, less tags and adipocytes, and less of these are going to be synthesized, which makes sense because if you're in a fasting state, you're not going to want to waste energy synthesizing stuff later. You want it now. So you're going to have breakdown processes. Adipocytes are going to break down into tags and fatty acids. Skeletal muscle is going to break down proteins into amino acids, which can be through gluconeogenesis, can be converted into carbohydrates. Um, liver will start making ketones, which are more efficient than glucose, but in excess can be toxic and lead to acidosis. And this, these can be used by the brain, for example, quite efficient. Another reason why, another confusing thing that hopefully this will explain it. One of the reasons why in a fed state you have glycolysis is, if you remember from last week, glycolysis is essential for tag synthesis because you need the glycerol backbone. So it, it is a state of getting rid of stuff from the bloodstream. Fasting is putting stuff in the bloodstream to move around to the body. Fed state is you want to store it so it's not going all over the body. Hope that makes sense. Um, let's talk about muscles. Muscles mainly use fatty acids as energy. In short bursts, really quickly, first 10 seconds sort of thing, they use ATP reserves, phosphocretinin, which essentially is the immediate breakdown of ATP to ADP. We don't talk about it much. Lots of energy but it's not very sustainable. Um, moderately active, you're gonna use glucose as well as a bit of fatty acids, maybe while you've started jogging for a bit. If you're really active, um, you're not gonna have enough oxygen to undergo kind of the citric acid pathway. So you'll undergo anaerobic respiration where glucose is converted to lactate. And in starvation, muscles are broken down into energy through gluconeogenesis, example. Um, this is important, you should know this, it's not too hard though. Main source of energy for the hearts in normal situations is lipids. They can use glucose and ketones. Um, they struggle in anaerobic conditions. And you know, you like you want your heart to have a lot of energy because if your heart doesn't beat, you're in a lot of trouble, probably not in a good place. So that's why I can use ketones and glucose, but lipids store more energy, so that's preferred. Brain usually uses blood glucose in places of empty or starvation, it can use ketones. The brain does not store energy. And it also has something called a brain blood barrier. So fatty acids can't get through. Um, red blood cells, they just use glucose. They um, only have anaerobic pathways. They cannot store energy and they have no storages. And I think the phosphate five, pent pentose five phosphate pathways involved here, you don't need to know that. Um, yeah, here it is. It uses glycolytic pentose five phosphate. So it only anaerobic, only uses glucose. Skeletal muscle, Often in normal source uses lipids that have a higher energy content, but in starvation can break down proteins in order to um, give it fuel, produce glyc um, gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis, I, I think you've learned, is the production of glucose of carbohydrates from non-carbohydrate sources. I think we're finished integrated. HEP, okay, this is, <laughs> you're gonna enjoy this. This is kind of about, Health, well-being, stress management, it's really, it's actually targeting you. They secretly teach you to be healthier, but they trick you by thinking you're helping other people. Integrative medicine is an approach that takes account the whole person, including all aspects of the lifestyle. It informs, it emphasizes a personal relationship between practitioner and patient. It is formed by evidence and use of a wide range of therapies. So it's not just like you give medicine and surgery, you can try complementary medicine, Herbal treatments, if there's evidence-based, lifestyle treatments like exercise, weight loss. As a whole, you look treat the person as a person. Why do med students need to know it? Um, they're applying this to you so you know what your patients are doing and kind of understand how to, like, it's hard to instruct someone to live healthier if you don't live healthier yourself, you know? So it's kind of just to understand. Not that you have to, I'm certainly the least healthy person in the world, but like, it's kind of good to have this concept. So they're targeting you in these classes. So you're learning how to self-improve, how to set goals, all of this, so you know what your patients are up to, so you can communicate more openly with them. And you know you need to learn about um, conventional treatments and also unconventional treatments that might work. Um, it's really essential. Most doctors are used now try to treat people in a holistic way. It offers treatments that are guided by their desires and their needs and what's important to them. But in saying this, holistic and um, complementary medicines all have to be evidence-based. So you also need to know what's ineffective, what's just symptomatic relief, and what doesn't provide a cure but might seem to or advertise that it does. 
And so your job is to help make, make, let patients make the most informed decision and safe decision that's possible for them. Um, integrated medicine, these are some kind of examples of things you can use. Some people might look to chiropractic and osteopathy. Um, yeah, you know, chiro, yeah, like spine, some people think that spinal misalignment leads to disease. It's a bit questionable. Um, but for some people it works and it might be effective for back pain and headache. And you need to know about this because some of your patients will want to try these things and you have to know if they're evidence-based and if they work or not. There's a variety of different massages, herbal medicines, pharm like natural pharmacy. Herbal is interesting because some commonly accepted drugs like digoxin used to be like herbal, like um, kind of, it's, it's something that maybe might have been kind of scoffed at before, but now it's very integrated into medicine. So um, there, there is merit to some of this herbal stuff. You've just got to take an evidence-based approach and make sure you understand interactions with some of the more obscure natural stuff with normal drugs. For example, um, oh, there's this drug that treats depression and it's a flower and it inter interacts. There's like lots of cross interactions. You'll learn about it. It's not important though, but you will learn about it. And also about nutrition, how that's important. Sorry, I've joined on a bit with this. Ethical issues with CAM is sometimes people get like mystery, miracle solutions, and you can give people false hope when things aren't based in evidence. And in a sense, you're giving them misinformation, which is very unethical. Um, you can exploit vulnerable people in a very easy state to be exploited. And it may also delay the use of medicine that is work or is conventional. And there are maybe potential dangers and side effects that aren't known if it's poorly researched. And often practitioners of it, of like Chiro, maybe of some of this more complementary alternative medicine, it's hard to know, like the sufficient training, it's hard to find people who are like completely trained. We're almost done, behavior change and lifestyle. They found in mid-final year, 20%, only 8% of medical students had burnout. And you're not going to perform, be, perform very well if you have burnout. So it's important to care about yourself and look after yourself, make sure you're in a mentally good place, easier said than done. Um, you have to improve the importance of lifestyle factors in promoting longevity. So like exercise, eating well. And you can see that the ten, top 10 most causes of death are very influenced by lifestyle, like um, weight, diet, sleep, etc. cetera. Um, these are some acronyms you're going to want to learn. So you might have already learned essence and history taken. Education is like, it's not teaching, like it's not what school you went to. <laughs> some people think what... Um, What's your education? Oh, I went to wherever, Xavier or whatever. I didn't go to Xavier. I don't know why I thought of that. But it's um, education is more about knowing yourself, motivation, attitudes, habits that enable yourself. Um, sorry, that doesn't make sense. Um, education is more about knowing yourself so you know like what's going to work for you, what do you want, and only through an understanding of your motivation and desires can you acquire therapy that's going to help you in the best way possible. It's also about managing stress you're spiritual or not and how that helps depression exercise nutrition connected with family friends environment um healthcare this is important to know bask behavior attitude skills knowledge this is about um education so behavior you need to know what people do what attitudes they have what skills can they have to kind of incorporate new styles of behavior and what do they understand about new styles of behavior and often an intervention in behavior change will have to target these things so what are people doing already what do they believe their abilities their efficacy what they understand almost done this is the french dude model um, by prochaska um, it's basically the stages of behavior change so and essentially it's saying people are only going to change their minds or change the behavior if they really want to so they need to stay in pre-contemplation is when they kind of, they don't want to change. They're not concerned about it. They're not thinking about it. Contemplation, they're woeing up pros and cons. Should they? A doctor can have, you can have more of an active role there. You're going to be pretty useless in pre-contemplation. Um, you're going to have some sort of determination or preparation where you're like thinking, okay, this is what I'm going to do. If I fail, this is how I'm going to do it. If I'm feeling sad, I'm going to have these techniques. Then you act on it. And then you're going to act and it's either going to work or it's not going to work. And then you can relapse maintenance. Sometimes you can go pre-contemplation. You're going to try again, or you're going to go into contemplation stage, termination. Um, contemplation, you're going to try again. And so it's, it's like a constant interchange between 
relapse in, trying again, relapse in, trying again. Criticism of this is it doesn't like people are more complex than this. They don't necessarily go in stages, but yeah, it's an important examinal concept. Also, adept is used for change in habits, awareness of your habit or your addiction. You need a decision to want to change it. You need effort to be able to um, really try to go out of your way to try to change yourself. Perseverance is to tolerate the uncertainty and discomfort, which is, yeah, and then you tolerate the dis discomfort and perseverance is to go through it even when it gets difficult. Almost done. Really short now. This is psychiatry. So this is about what is health and illness and what do people used to think? So in a religious perspective, people used to think illness were due to their sins, which is a social factor. Galen used to be not important, as it's almost not worth me saying, but humorism is like there's fluids in the body and they um, kind of interchanged for your well-being. Not important. Renaissance is when scientific exploration used to start to take place and they used to ascribe disease to biological factors. Cartesian, Descartes, um, he split kind of the soul from the body, which actually was a huge, quite detrimental to like the advancement of science because um, we kind of, when our soul was separate to our body, it's kind of changed the way people thought about the brain. It's not relevant. If you're interested, you can ask me about the effect Descartes had on like current neuroscience and understanding of consciousness, but we'll stay on topic. Um, I can't see because this has popped up. Main point is that health isn't just biological and throughout history, it's very influenced by a variety of social factors, the culture we live in, the religions we have, our psychology. There's a lot of factors that go into health beyond biology and there's a lot of models. And there's not to say well, any one is better than the others. It depends on the individual. Current model we now use is you have predisposing factors, which are risk factors. So these in biological sense, these can be genetic in a psychological sense you could maybe you have i won't make this too intense but maybe you just have like poor self-esteem because of experiences you've had um you can then have triggers for example uh, maybe someone says you suck or you get rejected that can really like trigger your poor self-esteem health wise maybe you have a genetic susceptibility to cancer and you're exposed to a carcinogen and you get sick um social isn't relevant um then perpetuating is like it's kind of ongoing it reinforces itself and then you have protective factors that help you so if you have a good general health maybe you don't smoke then your cancer is probably going to be held at bay psychologically if you have poor self-esteem if you're a good friend and family they can make you feel more um, self-efficacy and greater value socially is not really important as important to health it is a bit important if you, um let's say you have a limited education precipitating is that you need to like apply for this job that you need certain skills for but you didn't have the opportunity to do it so you don't get the job and it kind of perpetuates and protective is if you find people who can help assist you health important high yield memorizes a state of complete physical mental and social well-being not merely the absence of disease or infirmity so health is like an ideal it's not it's almost not achievable it's a it's kind of a platonic conception of something great a few studies on what health was. To Bauman found that young people's health is what functional, what they could do. Older people is what they could not do. Blackster thought that women tended to perceive health more in psychosocial well-being, men more in physical well-being. They're never going to ask you this in an exam because it's, a, um, yeah, they're not. They try to avoid um, gendered stuff. They even, even when like it seems more um, appropriate, they try to avoid gendered stuff so unlikely you'll need to know this but men health more in terms of physical prowess women more psychosocial australian perception only 56 percent thought they had excellent health 15 percent thought they had fair or poor and it um this varies with age so the older you get um obviously the more limited people are in their health um in another study, in Hunter's study, most people said ideal health is impossible. So like the World Health Organization is an ideal. And they had eight attributes, which are physical, psychological, intellectual, spiritual, occupational, social, environment. Uh, you actually, they did ask a question on this once. Um, you can probably common sense it, but there's a lot of factors that go into health that are physical. And basically think of it environment and in mind. And all of these either fall into the either environment, which is... Um, environment um social occupational or in the mind spiritual 
um, psychological intellection. Almost done. I think two more slides, one more slide. Impact of culture on health and illness. Culture is the integrated patterns of thoughts, communications, customs, beliefs, values, and institutions associated with racial, ethnic, or linguistic groups with religious, spiritual, biological, geographic, social characteristics. So essentially, it's the thought patterns you inherit that inform your values, how you believe, how you communicate, how you talk to people. It's dynamic. It changes over someone's lifestyle. It changes depending on who they're with. It changes as they age. It changes on who you ask. It's quite, even though culture is quite a wide set, concept its implementation and understanding is quite personal um how does it impact health belief systems so in um the west we have a separation of mind and body because of descartes essentially and um we see our physical as kind of removed from our mental state whereas there's now a more holistic thing to say they're more interconnected um it might be not socially acceptable for some people to seek help they might feel that a society might want them to be stoic and to last with help and community and family structures in some um, communities, particularly in indigenous communities, particularly in um, uh, other, yeah, in some countries, they kind of prioritize the family as more important maybe than the individual or the family is equally as important and they should be involved in the role of the healthcare and treatment. And you might even have an obligation to look for your family, whereas in other, maybe more Western, it's more individual based you're more um, going to go to the doctor by yourself, they'll treat you by yourself, more likely. That's all. Any questions? I hope that...